morning, Lifeway Church. We are so excited to worship with you today. And uh, wow, it's quiet. Um, I got to play something. Sorry, that got awkward. Okay, I'm just so excited to have you all here today. And I'm so excited for what God is going to do. He is present in this house already because we're gathered to worship him. Amen. So let's just welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit. God, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he shed his blood so that we could come boldly into your throne room and give you worship and worship your name, Jesus, and elevate you and exalt you and magnify you in this house. God, you are worthy of praise. And Lord, we give you all of our praise today. All of our worship belongs to you, Jesus. You're worthy of it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Let's give God praise today. He's worthy of it. Amen. We worship you, Lord. All right, church, put your hands together and let's worship.
you just love old hymns. We're gonna sing my absolute favorite hymn today. It's called, How Great Thou Art. I just love the goodness of God, the greatness of God, because when we are not strong, He is strong in us. When we're not able, He is more than able. And so let's just sing this together with that heart and that mind. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power through all the
My, my prayer each week is that we grow into a, a deeper awareness of the presence of the Lord. You see, it's the presence of the Lord that will sustain you, not some fancy message from a pastor. It's the presence of the Lord. And God reminded me in Psalm 16, 8, he says, I am always aware of the Lord's presence. He is near and nothing can shake me. When you get into the presence of God in worship, Something powerful takes place because Jesus has entered into our area. Are you with me? I was asking the Lord this morning, I said, Lord, is there a particular word that you want me to share with the church? And he said, yes, remind him that I'm their friend. I said, okay. And he led me to two scriptures here. John 15, 15 says this. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. And then Proverbs 18, 24. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Let's pray. Father, you're a friend that sticks closer than a brother to us. Father, we know you as king. We know you as Lord of our lives. But Lord, you also want us to know you as friend, to have an intimate walk with a friend. Father, Lord, other, other friends we know may fail us or may leave us when we mess up or whatever. But we know, Lord, that you stick closer than a brother. So we embrace you as our friend today. We love you so much. And everybody said, amen. amen. Tell you what, go ahead and greet four or five people around you. Say hi. Get to know somebody by name. Hey, I'm so glad to see you guys this morning. Tell you what, you're in for a real treat. And what I mean by a treat is that I, I hope you come every Sunday when you come here to uh, hear a word from the Lord. Amen? I want you to hear a word from the Lord. I want you to write those things down. So make sure you have your pens out or your phones out to take some notes. Um, but we have a guest here. And I was, so, I was blown away by the Lord because I was praying about bringing in Keith. And uh, Keith travels all over the world. And to get him to work into our schedule just didn't fit. Well, he had a cancellation. When he called me, I said, Lord, is this it? He goes, yes, you're bringing Keith in. I said, okay. I'll push pause on my sermon. I know you guys love hearing me, but <laughs> I'm going to give you ears a break today. Um, so during the message, just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Because I believe God has a very specific word that Keith is going to share. And he's got a little, if you haven't figured it out, there's a cross up here. But let's welcome Keith Wheeler. And he's asked if he could preach from down here, so he's going to bring a message from the floor today. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. What a, what a wonderful honor and, and privilege to be here with you. Could you come up here? I'm married to a fairy tale princess. And uh, I was with some of you fellas, but we, you know, none of us are very good looking, but my girlfriend makes me look really good, uh, and, and I call her my girlfriend, I call her my princess, because she is. I think so often we fellas, we forget that we're 
we're called to still date our wives. And it, once we, we cross the finish line, you know, we, we get the girl, we get the ring, we say, I do, then we move on to our next conquests. And my encouragement is keep going, uh, keep pursuing. Uh, she is your girlfriend. She is your princess. People say, why is, why is she not your queen? Well, I'll tell you why she's not my queen. There's one king. He's the king of all kings. And I'm not him. And if I remember she's his daughter, then I'm going to treat her really special. And uh, besides that, if you've ever watched any movie, uh, any queen is usually ruthless and wicked and evil and conniving. <laughs> I don't want to be married to that. And so um, God looked around the world, and he saw that no one was worthy of this woman. But he saw that he could trust me to take care of her heart. And, and I believe that about all you fellows that are married. God looked around the world and saw that there was no one worthy of your fairy tale princess. But he saw that he could trust you to protect her heart and to pursue her heart. You know, there's a lot of things that pull on their attention. There's social media, there's work, there's friends, there's other fellas. And my goal at the end of the day is to win her heart. And so I wanted her to, this is, her real name is Nicole. Everybody says, what's her name? I just know Princess. Her name is Nicole. So here's my fairy tale Princess Nicole. I just wanted her to say hello to you guys. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, we always love the, the drive here. Uh, we're from Tulsa, so it's a two and a half hour, nice, beautiful drive. I love the, the fields and the peacefulness here. So thank you so much for having us, and worship was absolutely wonderful. So thank you. So I, I just want to begin by saying more than anything, I love Jesus. And, and I know that when I, I stand in front of people, there is such an awesome responsibility, and, and I've done it thousands of times. I'm not a natural-born speaker. Uh, I was just telling Pastor Tanya that how uh, many times people see me as this bold, crazy, wild evangelist because of some of the things that God has done. But the truth of the matter is, I'm probably the, the, the most shy, timid, fearful, insecure, scared person that you've ever met. I'm, I'm an absolute introvert, and God did not call me according to my strengths or talents. I think he usually does that with most people. He uses, you know, all those strength tests and personality tests to help you know where you fit in best. But for me, he called me absolutely according to my greatest fears and greatest weaknesses. And so even though I've done this thousands of times, I, I tremble because here's the responsibility. I feel like I have this responsibility to stand here and hold the heart of Jesus High enough that you could see how deeply, how madly, how wildly he is in love with you. And that you would see that this is not about greater faith or greater belief or greater trust. It's not about doing more. It's about seeing how much he loves you and then us just saying yes. Because my life with, with the cross on the road has, has been my life with Jesus on the road. God willing, I leave on Thursday to carry the cross in two places maybe you've never heard of. They're in Western Africa on the coast, right as Africa, the big hump comes and it starts to do the tail. There's Equatorial Guinea and there's Gabon. And so God willing, I'm leaving on Thursday to, to leave for there. And I don't know anybody there except Jesus. They speak French in one and Portuguese in the other and tribal languages in both. And the only one who I know is for sure going to speak English is Jesus. 
And the only one who knows for sure where I'm going to sleep is Jesus. See, I've slept on park benches and bus stops before, but Jesus was always with me. I've slept under bridges. He's been gracious enough some nights when it's, it's raining to give me a bridge or at least a, a little slide in a children's playground. But Jesus slept with me. And some nights I've spent in jail. I've been in jail more than 40 times. My cross has been in jail more than 50 times. But each time, Jesus was with me. I stood in front of firing squads. I counted to two. I didn't know if the next blink that I would actually see the face of the one that I've known face to face for all these years. But I didn't know that whether I did or whether I didn't, he was with me. This journey has been a journey with Jesus. And that's exactly what Pastor Terry was trying to say just a few moments ago. The presence of God, my friends, is not an experience that you get when you feel and the music is right and they play your favorite song. It's the reality of whether I'm in Antarctica, the ends of the earth, or Tuvalu, which is the least visited nation, the smallest nation on the earth. Or whether I'm walking into Ukraine, I walked this summer with my, my fairy tale princess. The day before we arrived in one place, a drone attack killed eight people. Two days after we left another place, just two blocks from where we were, 12 rockets hit and killed nearly 30 people. Whether it's been going to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro or through the Amazon jungle this past summer, the reality is Jesus was with me. I didn't have a choir. I didn't have a band. The number one promise in the Bible is I will be with you. The number one command is don't be afraid. 366 times, don't be afraid. But always with don't be afraid is I will be with you. And I love the idea, the truth, that he's our friend. He is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. And yet the other side of the question needs to be asked. Yes, he calls me his friend. He said, no longer, John 15, 15, no longer do I call you servants. I call you friends. But my friends, it's one thing to be called a friend. It's another to be a friend. He's your friend. Are you his friend? Do you know what he likes? Do you know what makes him happy? Do you know what makes him cry? Do you know what makes him laugh? Do you know his favorite color? Have you even ever asked him, if you're his friend, don't you do that with someone you like? Or do we just come to him with our endless lists of, you need to do this, and please do this, and oh, I really need this, and then sign off in Jesus' name, 1040, good buddy. How do we do it? And do we just read his word because we're supposed to, and we've got to keep our Bible streak going on, on the U version of Bible? Or do we come to listen to him? This morning I want to talk to you about that value of him. How much is he worth? Because when, you, when he's your treasure above all treasures, when he's the treasure that causes you to sell everything, to abandon everything, to surrender all like the old song him says, that's what changes everything. That's what changed the, my, my story. You see, I'm, I'm just a, a, I'm really and truly, I'm a hillbilly from Arkansas. Uh, I, I grew up near Possum Pass. I used to take my dates to Booger Holler. Mountain Dew was invented in my hometown. 
It, it wasn't called Mountain Dew. It was called Kickapoo Joy Juice. Didn't market well outside of Arkansas, so they had to change the name. My mama, no kidding, for those of you who are old enough to remember Beverly Hillbillies, my mama was on four episodes of the Beverly Hillbillies. So I don't have a great pedigree. When I did become a Christian, I didn't know where to start because my family didn't go to church. I knew a girl who, and she was really pretty, and she went to the Catholic church, so I figured God must want me to be Catholic. And so I met the priest, signed up for the classes, and ladies, you have so much influence on us. I became Catholic. Um, but there was another girl, and she went to the Episcopal church, and you've got to cover all your bases. So I met her, met her priest, signed up for the classes, was baptized there as well. But I played football with a guy named Ab, and he went to the Presbyterian church. I met his pastor, signed up for those classes, and I was baptized Presbyterian. But I was also playing basketball with a guy named Dave, and he went to the Lutheran church. So I signed up for their classes, went, was baptized there as well. And, and those are just the ones you have to have classes. I was also baptized United Methodist, Disciples of Christ, Evangelical Free, Assemblies of God, Independent Charismatic, American Baptist, Missionary Baptist, and eight times in the Southern Baptist Church. So whatever your theology is on baptism, let's just say I'm covered. <laughs> Sprinkled, splashed, dunked, held under. Bubbles coming out. I, I've got it all. Read my Bible every year, Genesis to Revelation. I like to read. One year I made it through three times in a year. They told me you need to pray an hour a day. Jesus said, can you not tarry one hour? So I prayed an hour a day. My parents used to make me do transcendental meditation for an hour. And uh, my, my special word, mantra, if you will, was ing, I-N-G. So I had to say ing for an hour. And then I became a Christian, and I had, praying was much easier than inging. So, uh, man, I could do that one. Then they told me the things don't do, you know, don't swear. Okay, I, I never did that one. Uh, don't, don't smoke. Never made sense to me to put fire in my mouth. Uh, I was training for the Olympics anyway. Uh, don't, don't drink. That was an easy one. My parents drank a lot, and I saw how foolish they acted. And Don't chase girls. That was a lot harder, but that was one of the rules. So, And I, I made straight A's. I qualified for the Olympic uh, trials but we have a saying where I'm from just because there's paint on the outside of the barn doesn't mean there's not manure on the inside you can have a murderer in the room nobody knows except him you can have two people cheating they're fooling around and nobody knows except them but you have a self-righteous person in the room everybody knows except them And that was me. I, I, I wasn't the condemning, pointing my finger, but in my heart I was. But here's the thing. I, I never stole anything from people, but people had stuff I wish I had. I, I, never, um, I never killed anybody. But there were a few people I wouldn't have minded if they just disappeared. And Jesus looks at the heart. And if you notice in this whole story, I'm telling you, I never once mentioned my journey with Jesus. I said I became a Christian. See, my testimony is I was a Christian for 20 years, and then I met Jesus. I was the best rule keeper there ever was. I did it all. The baptisms, the Bible readings, the church going. I, I did everything you're supposed to do except meet Jesus. Was I saved? I believed with my heart that Jesus died on the cross, rose again, is alive. I, I could tell you apologetics. I think I would have gone to heaven. But my friends, is that the only goal? Is just to go to heaven? Do we just say yes to Jesus, get born again, get saved, and, and then we have to endure this life until we get him? Or do we walk in his presence? Do we walk in this intimacy with a, we, we say it all the time, but do we do it? It's about a relationship, not a religion. But do we really have a relationship? Or do we just have rules and we end up being weird? And there's a lot of us that are, let's be honest, we're weird. 
And is there any wonder that our kids don't want this? Because they're tired of religion and rules. Because we've not shown them how sweet it is to know Jesus. How much is he worth to you? If I were to ask that question this morning, I think every one of us would say, oh, he's worthy. He's worth everything. And we sing songs. We sang songs this morning. How worthy he is. How great he is. But is he greater than the Sooners or greater than the Cowboys? Is he greater than how well your crops do or who the president is or your political candidate? How much is he worth? Well, let's just... How much time does he get and how much time does your television or social media get? Who's worth the most? If you want to know how much is he worth, look at your checkbook. Or if you come to Oklahoma City or Tulsa and drive through traffic during rush hour, how much is he worth? (laughs) See, we don't have to count the cost here in the United States. At least not yet. But I've been in places, I've been in countries where people have to count the cost. I've been in places where you can be imprisoned coming in with a cross. I went into one country and it said, welcome to the Islamic Republic of this this nation. And it says proselytization, uh, strictly forbidden, punishable by death. Well, that's a wake-up call when I'm coming in with a, with a large wooden cross and I'm not going to be able to sneak around. But how much is Jesus worth? I'll never forget being in the country of Romania when it was still communist. Evangelization forbidden. And it was a November day. It was a, a cold drizzle, probably 50 degrees. And a pastor wanted to walk with me. He wanted to carry my cross. But as, as I'm carrying the cross... This, I put it on his shoulder. He could barely walk anyway. And he's just hobbling along. And finally I said, Pastor, what happened to your legs? He said, not my legs, my feet. And I said, Pastor, what happened to your feet? And he smiles, this ear-to-ear beaming grin. And he said, I never denied Jesus. I said, but what does denying Jesus have to do with your feet? The authorities came to him and they said, you can only preach Jesus one hour, one day a week in your building. But not him. Wherever he went, he talked about Jesus. Finally, the authorities said, okay, just to shut you up, you can preach 24 hours a day, seven days a week in your building. But stop telling people about Jesus wherever you go. And he said, for me to stop talking about Jesus wherever I go is for me to deny Jesus. Over the next years, he ended up spending 21 years in prison. Not one sentence, but multiple sentences. 21 total years in prison. Finally, They kept saying this over and over again. We're not asking you to deny Jesus. Just stop preaching wherever you go. And he said, for me to stop preaching wherever I go is for me to deny him. And they ended up hanging him upside down in shackles by his ankles. They gave him one more chance and he he just smiled and said, do whatever you can. Do whatever you have to do, but I'm not going to stop talking to people about Jesus wherever I go. And they took these rubber hoses filled with sand and they began to beat his feet till there's no more skin left on his feet until every bone is broken. They gave him one more chance. He said, I've already told you. And they had two skillets with hot boiling oil and they placed those bloody, broken feet in that hot boiling oil and he looked at me and he said I walk with it like this I mean his face was like an angel I walk like this because I never denied Jesus 
See, they have to count the cost. In, in the Bible, if you've got your Bible, turn to Revelation, please. Revelation chapter 4. And I just want you to, to look quickly. Sorry, verse 8. Yeah. Revelation. I'm in the wrong version, sorry. There we go. Chapter 4, beginning with verse Sorry. Technology is wonderful when it works. <laughs> but mine's working too fast and it keeps on jumping to the wrong chapter. <laughs> there. Oh. It says, before the throne, oh, I'm beginning in verse 6. It says, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night. And they say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to the one who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they exist and we're created. And if you read chapter 5, it repeats that. So often people call the book of Revelation a book of the end times. It's called a revelation of Jesus. It's a book of worship. And we see over and over again, worthy, worthy, worthy. How much is he worth? Everything. Let's look at our lives. For me, I can say there were time after time after time I've been given the opportunity to do something with Jesus. We don't do anything for Jesus. We do it with Jesus. Carry a cross. It didn't make any sense to me, and, and it really doesn't make any sense because I am a hillbilly from Arkansas, and we barely speak English there. We've got our own words. I mean, in Arkansas, we, we measure rain by frogs. If it rains a little bit, it makes a frog blink, so we call it a frog blanker. If it rains a little bit harder, we call it a, a frog strangler, because it strangle a frog. And if it rains really, really hard, we call it a toad floater. So we've got our, you know, you, you knock someone with, you give them a slobber knocker if you hit them so hard because you knock the slobber out of their head, and you don't call it a head, you call it a head. And uh, you, you, you you done knock him all ding dang doozlefied. So we've, we've got our own words. And they speak other languages. So I, barely do I speak English. And now I have to go to these other countries and they speak Russian or German. Or I'm, I'm married to a woman from Germany and, and she didn't speak English until she's eight years old. And, and there's other languages in the world. And one of the first places God called me to go, they speak Spanish. And the only thing I knew in Spanish was I learned when I was a seventh grader. And I was in a play. I never took Spanish, but I was in a play. And in this play, I had to say, 
Cuando arregla mi cuarto, no encuentro nada. That means when they clean my room, I can't find anything. That doesn't help when you're walking with this. So I start walking down the road, and, and I get a Spanish-English dictionary. And I look up, hello. And it's spelled H-O-L-A. In Spanish, you don't pronounce the H. It's hola. Nobody told me. So it was either hola or hala. And in Arkansas, we had y'all or yuns to everything. So I'm walking down the road. Hola, hola, y'all. Hala, hala, yuns. And, and I got better. I, I made it all the way up to a place called Tegucigalpa. I began in, in Panama. And, you know, you practice every day and you learn new words every day. And ahora puedo predicar en español. I, now I can speak in Spanish or preach in Spanish. Uh, pero mi gramática es muy malo. But my grammar is really bad. But when I got there, I, I was invited by the local preachers to speak to lots of people, thousands and thousands of people. It was a, a big rally, and, and it's kind of like Billy Graham. They had a big platform, and I stood up on it, and, and they said, you don't need an interpreter. And I said, I think I do. And they said, no, Spanish is the language of the heart. Just speak from your heart, my friend. And it's the language of the angels, and people will understand from the heart. And I said, okay. My grammar's going to be really bad. That's okay. People will understand. They will appreciate it. Okay. And I stood up there, and, and I was going really good. I, if, you know, you use your preaching voice. And Jesus will forgive all your sins. Uh, you know, it's a lot of people, and you feel like, you know, it, it's, sometimes it's nonsense. If you're not careful... Let, let me just say this. It goes two ways. Sometimes there's, well, oftentimes, there's pressure here. All of us put pressure on this guy. And here's how, how you can know it. What do you talk about Sunday after the service? You talk about how well he did, and if you don't like what he said, you know, you pack your stuff off, up and you go off and you find another person who's going to say what you like. And what that does is it produces pressure on this fella. And so this fella, if you're not careful, if he's not careful, feels a pressure to perform and produce. And, and so then you get people doing all kinds of silly things and coming up with all kinds of, just to say the same message. The message is Jesus. Jesus is eternal. This is not a television program. And, and so, so, but I was feeling that pressure, and there's thousands of people in them, and Jesus will forgive all your sins. Well, the problem in Spanish is the word for sin is pecado. But the word in Spanish for dead fish is pescado. <laughs> Sounds a whole lot like pecado, pescado, and I said, and Jesus will forgive all your dead fish. And everybody did exactly what you did. And I thought, I am being persecuted for the gospel. So I said, no, I mean it. I really mean Jesus will speak, will, will forgive all your dead fish. They laughed a little harder. I looked at the pastors that invited me, and they've got their heads down. Oh, you really did need an interpreter. I don't know enough. And that becomes an excuse. And, 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 but the point is, what happens when you don't know enough? And what happens when the people do snicker or laugh at you, either at your face or behind your back? How much is Jesus worth? I went to this little country called Vanuatu. It's way out in the Pacific. It's between Australia and Hawaii and Papua New Guinea. And they have the original bungee jumpers there. They actually live in the trees. The only clothes the fellas wear is a little rope around their waist, nothing in the back, and a broom in the front. The only clothes the ladies wear is nothing on top, just a rope around their waist, but they've got leaves all the way around. And they hunt with bow and arrows and spears with stone tips. It's like going back in time. And I was with these people. Their right of manhood is they build this tower out of um, bamboo, and they tie a vine to their leg, and they dive off head first. So it's, it's just wild. And I was there with National Geographic. I was learning their language. I was preaching to them. At dinner time, they eat on the ground, but the, the ladies eat over here, the fellas eat over here, and I'm eating with the fellas, and, and we're, we're there, and they've got their, 
their uh, spears and their bow and arrows, and their food was delicious. And I tried to tell them as best as I could, oh, your food is wonderful. Uh, but I can't eat anymore because I'm full. But I used the wrong word for full. Oh, I can't eat anymore because I'm pregnant. <laughs> so they, they laughed, <laughs> told me what I said, and I tried to recover, and I tried to say, I'm sorry, I'm really embarrassed. Their word for embarrassed is I'm getting hot. But I chose the wrong hot word. And I told these fellows in their little loinclothy things with their spears next to them, I'm sorry, I'm really starting to have physical romantic attraction for you guys. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> How much is Jesus worth? Do you stop when things go wrong? Or do you keep going because he's the worthy one? Many times people will say, you can't go into this country or that country and I could give you a list of all these countries. They say it's a closed country or a restricted access nation. Where in the Bible is that in the Bible? It's not. So many of what we say, I don't feel led. Well, what does a feeling led feel like? Does it tickle? Is it a shazoom? Is it a woy, 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 woy? What, what is it like? And if you're waiting for open doors, we're going to be in this room a long time because every door is closed. Sometimes you have to push on a door. Sometimes you have to turn a handle. Sometimes you have to find a key. Sometimes you just have to kick the door in. Jesus didn't say just go into the countries that welcome you. I'll give you one example. Iraq, before the United States went in the second time. Or this was, uh, before the United States went in, this was before the second war. And uh, I tried for two years to get into Iraq. Saddam Hussein was in power. Every time that I would go to another country, I would go directly to the Iraqi embassy to try to get a visa. But always my answer was the same. Because your passport is an American passport, a USA passport, entry denied. Two years. Guess that means you can't get in, right? But that's not what my Bible says. Just because they keep saying no, there's always a way. Sometimes you just have to work a little harder. And finally, I got this idea. There is one open door because... It was an embargo against the nation. All the nations around were closed uh, except Jordan. And because of humanitarian relief, food, clothing, medical supplies, that border was open. So I flew to Amman, Jordan with a buddy named Tim. And at the airport, as I'm collecting my cross, somebody sees the cross and they say, what's that? And I said, I'll give you three guesses. And sometimes we're called to be, well, we're always called to be salt. But sometimes we open the salt shaker and give them all the salt. And, and so I gave him three guesses. He didn't guess it. I said, it's a cross. He said, why do you have a cross? And I began to share. And he said, I was born in Baghdad. He said, I've made that trip over 100 times. I will help you get into Iraq. So now God has helped me meet a guy. We, we rent a car, and he and my friend drive ahead. We finally arrive at the, the Jordanian border, convince them to let us out. They did say, don't step off the road. There's landmines. That's great to know. Um, so we're walking, and soon you see a tall statue of Saddam Hussein. And there's a gate on both sides with a mechanical arm that goes up and down. As far as you can see this way and this way is barbed wire and then razor wire up on top. And when you get to the little booth, you present your paperwork, your documentation, and then the arm goes up. But the only paperwork or documentation I had were these papers. And these papers say, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and go into all of it and preach the gospel. And so I said, okay, uh, we'll, I'm, I'm going in. And before these guys could do anything... Uh, I leaned my cross so that this much of it 
is over the little mechanical arm. And before anybody could do anything else, I laid down on the ground. So this much of me is now in Iraq. And I lay there and I prayed, hallelujah, Jesus, I did it. I'm in Iraq and my cross is here. I obeyed you. Not all of me and not all my cross, but as best as I can, I obeyed you. If you want me to go any further, the rest is up to you. And I began to pray that Jesus would bless Iraq. He blessed the children. They would know the things that make for peace. They would know the true prince of peace. And while I'm laying there, I, I sense people standing there. And I peeked. And there were boots. And I think, I'll pray longer. And the soldiers will leave. But the longer I prayed, the more boots came. So I thought, I better stand up quick. So I stand up, dust myself off, and I'm surrounded with gunmen. They're all pointing their guns at me. What are you doing? Why are you here? What is the meaning of this? What is the purpose of this? And I have these little red stickers that has a cross in the middle. They're fluorescent red. And they say, smile, God loves you. So I start putting these little red stickers on all the soldiers and on their guns, on the butt end of their guns. I said, praise the Lord, I'm, I'm here for Jesus. He loves you. And this is a cross, and it's a reminder that because he died, you can be forgiven. And I'm telling the whole thing. Because he died, you can be forgiven. Because he's alive, you can know him. Yes, he's a prophet, but he's more than that. He's God in the flesh, and he loves you like crazy. And two of these soldiers, I look, and a couple of them are crying, but two of them, they, they peel off, and they go on the radio, and they come back, and they say, we have good news. You are the most honored and welcome guest of Saddam Hussein. Welcome to Iraq. And I had more liberty and more freedom to carry the cross in Iraq under Saddam Hussein than I have had even here in the United States. And let me just add, my cross has been welcomed in more bars and nightclubs than it has been in churches. And let me just add, I've had more beatings, more gunshots fired at me, more guns pointed at me in my ear, in my nose, down my mouth, in the United States than all of the rest of the world put together. We have work to do. We really do. In fact, the two places I was beaten, Shreveport, Louisiana. Buckle of the Bible Belt. Maybe it's not because darkness is increasing, because darkness has no power to increase. It's when the light recedes. Darkness only travels as fast as the light retreats. How much is Jesus worth? My excuses, my excuses are, there's closed doors. My excuses are, they're laughing at me. My excuses are, I don't know enough. My excuses are, fill in the blank. What are your excuses? My excuses are, it's too dangerous. It is. Let me just tell you, I've been hit by cars four different times. I've been stoned with rocks three different times. Beaten and left for dead twice. I can't tell you how many times guns have been put in my ear, up my nose, down my throat. I've been held at knife point by one of the, the well-known terrorist groups in our, in our world. Uh, they were threatening to cut off my head. They took turns urinating on me and on the cross. It's dangerous. I told you I've been in jail more than 40 times, the cross more than 50 times. It's dangerous. Snake bit here nearly killed me. Spider bit here nearly killed me. A monkey bit me on the neck. A baboon bit me back here. Uh, camel bit me. Donkey bit me. More cats than I can count. And way more dogs have bit me than I can count. It's dangerous. I've been chased by elephants. I've been chased by rhinos. I've been almost eaten by hippopotamus. Twice, crocodiles have attacked me. It's dangerous. That's a very real one. But my question is, how much is Jesus worth? In fact, Jesus said, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. But he who seeks to lose his life for my sake and the gospel's sake, he will find it. One translation says it this way. He who seeks to keep his life safe will lose it. 
Do you know it's possible to die at age 91 but stop living when you're only 19? And we simply exist and endure. And we just count the days, count the days, count the days. See, that's why we get more excited about the second coming. We're not excited about who's coming. We're excited about getting out of this world. We're not excited about the wedding that we're going to. But when Jesus is worth everything, it doesn't matter. They can't threaten me. They can't bribe me. They can't control me. They can't manipulate me. I'm free. Because love makes me free. And that's why people confuse this as boldness. It's not boldness, it's love. I've seen how valuable he is. I've seen how worthy he is, and I've laid it down. I've said, Jesus, I want you to be seen. I want everybody to see you for who you are. Is that the desire of your heart? See, that's what a friend wants for their friend. That's why I want my princess to come up, and I want all of you to see her, because I'm in love with her. I'm head over heels, wildly, madly, crazy in love. We we were in the elevator this morning and she had to rub the lipstick off my face when somebody else got on there because we were smooching before this other guy got on the... We, we just, we like each other. But guess what? I want to be marked for Jesus wherever I go as well. Is that your desire? Or are we just Christians and we're Christian, American Christians because we live here and this is all we know. And instead of seeing Muslims as people that he loves and that he wants to come to know him, we see them as enemies or Buddhists or Hindus or the homeless people on the street corners. And instead of seeing them as kidnapped royalty, we see them as monsters to be afraid of and creatures to run away from. Everybody's not out to get us. The devil is, but everybody else is not. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. And if he wants you to keep living, it's his responsibility. How much is he worth? Paul said, for me to live as Christ, to die is, don't answer too quick, what does gain mean? Better. Do you really believe that? For me to live as Christ, to die is better. Don't call 911. I promise I'm not suicidal, but I can't wait till I die. Last year, my princess and I, we went on a date and we found our, our plot and, and we, you know, reserved it. And uh, ironically, the cemetery is called Calvary and our area is called Foot of the Cross. We were the plot number one. So Keith Wheeler, who's carried a cross around the world, is, is going to be buried at the foot of the cross at Calvary. So... That's pretty cool. And we have a picture of us holding hands and smiling. The girl says, I've never seen a couple like this. I can't wait. But until that time, I'm going to do everything I can to magnify the beauty and the majesty and the worthiness and the glory of Jesus Christ because he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. Are these just words in a book that has no meaning? Or have you seen his value? See, I wouldn't have talked like this the first 20 years of my life because I was a good Christian and I wanted my life to be a, a witness. And people say, well, now that you've met Jesus, you're a little bit radical. No, I'm just in love. And do you know they can't kill me until my days are done? The Bible says he's numbered my days. But the Bible says teach me to number my days. In other words, I want to make my days count. I was walking from Panama to Mexico, sleeping in, a, in an old van, and I uh, woke up to a, open the door, close the door of the van, and uh, the cross is leaning against the, it's leaning against the outside of the van. So as I close the door of the van, someone grabs my shirt, I was wearing a t-shirt and blue jeans, we're sleeping in this van, and uh, um, it's a Scooby-Doo van. Uh, 
We just bought it right before this trip, and that became our home. But somebody grabs my shirt and pulls me forward. When I fall forward, something sharp and metallic hits my face, breaks a tooth, cuts my face, and I'm hearing people yell. But at 2 o'clock, I don't speak English, let alone Spanish. And, and it's so dark because even in the daytime, you can't see the, the sky. You just see the, the, the jungle canopy. It's dark, dark, dark. And they're yelling. Finally, I understand as my eyes adjust There's like eight guys, 10 guys in front, 12, 15 behind, and they're all holding automatic weapons. That's what hit my face. And they're yelling, we're going to kill you, we're going to kill you. And I said, I I got an idea. Oh, they got the wrong guy, Scooby-Doo van, they think we're doing drugs. I said, no drugs, no drugs. And they point their guns at me and they say, one. I said, no, 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 this is a holy cross. I'm saying it in my best Spanish. Walking from Panama to Mexico. Maybe you've seen me on the news. Two. No, Jesus died. You can be forgiven. He's alive. You can know him. Um, Say yes and welcome him. And they put the clips in. I hear. All I could think now, I just, I I have a little pocket Bible. I hold it up like this. And all I, they scared the Spanish right out of me. And all I could remember in Spanish was, Cristo te ama. Jesus loves you. I'm just like this. They were here. Close enough that when I fell forward, so that, this close, they're standing right here. The next thing I know, they're twice the distance from here to the back doors. Not the back wall, the back doors exiting. And they're laying flat on their backs. They're covering their faces. Their guns are scattered every place. And they're screaming and crying like 10-year-old little girls. And they're saying, ay, ay, la luz, la luz, es muy grande, es muy fuerte. The light, the light is too bright. I never saw them walk, jump, run, crawl, fly. I didn't see a light. I didn't feel. I didn't see. I didn't hear anything. And how do they get there? It's it's like in some of you who are older remember when we went to the, the movies, it was film strip, and sometimes it would get stuck. Someone would have to go up, and, and, and then you'd miss like eight or ten frames. I missed eight or ten frames. But it's real because they're jumping in two big king cab trucks, and they're spinning gravel, and they're driving off, left their guns behind. What was it? Maybe God put, you know, 100,000 watts in the taillight of a lightning bug. Uh, Or maybe Jesus, the one who is light, who is the light of the world, who in his light we see light, stepped out and said his days aren't done. But it can be something as as ordinary as I'm walking down the road in Uganda and I don't know where I'm going to sleep one night and the sun is setting and and there's no villages around. And and, uh, I mean, I see animals out around, big animals, Africa animals, but I don't know where I'm going to sleep in this truck little Toyota, we call it a Tacoma, they call it Hilux, pulls up next to me as I'm walking, it's driving, and the guy says, get in the car, get in the car, and I I said, no, no, I'm I'm walking, I'm walking around the world, I'm I'm looking for a place to sleep, I'm walking for Jesus, yes, I know that, but you must get in the car now, bless you, brother, God bless you, you don't have to be angry. Uh, this is a cross for peace. Jesus died. You can be forgiven. He's alive. You can know. Yes, I know that. But if you don't get in the car now, you will die. No, oh, bless you, brother. Peace, peace. Jesus is a prince of peace. Me? No, me. The lion, it will eat you. And, and I look, and about from me to that set of candles was a lion. I couldn't see him because of the high grass. So I got in the car. <laughs> So a supernatural light that I never saw, but a very natural car that just happened to drive up. How much is he worth? If that lion would have eaten me, Jesus was worth it. But he had plans. If those guys would have shot me, Jesus was worth it. I just pray may my life and my death bring honor and glory to Jesus. Here's the thing. Jesus did the same thing with us. How much are they worth? He said everything. And so he left heaven. 
And he lived a sinless life on this earth for 33 years. He played on those Galilean hillsides, and I'm sure he fell and cut his knee. And that is holy blood, but that was not shed for you and me, not yet. And if you've ever worked in a shop and you know blood is going to be shed, he worked in his daddy's shop, and that was blood that was shed, and that's spotless and pure blood, but that was not shed for you and me. But in a garden one night, he's praying and he's thinking about you and me. And the Bible says he sweat drops of blood. Now it's for you and for me. Because he's saying they're worthy, Father, they're worthy. One of his best friends comes along and betrays him with a kiss. And the fists begin to fly and blood flows from his mouth and flows from his nose. And they pluck out his beard. For you and for me. And they take him from one trial to the next. And finally they say, okay, we're going to scourge him. The victim would be stripped naked. His feet would be bound, his hands would be bound. And they would take nine pieces of of leather, laced with glass and metal and bone. Thirty-nine lashes is what tradition says. The Jewish law was 40 minus 1. Studies show after 13 lashes, there's no skin. Between 18 and 25, you can see the internal organs. Because he said, you are worthy. Because they are worthy. And they took that bloody slashed, ripped open back, and they put a robe on him. And the blood begins to dry and clot. And they cram a crown of thorns on his head. I've got one on my wall, two and a half, up to four inches long. It's from Israel. Not a little rose bush briars like we have. Perhaps piercing his eyes. And they sped on him. And then they rip that robe off and they place on him a cross. Probably didn't look like this. Sure wasn't worn down after the years of handling. And it definitely didn't have a wheel. It could have been a tree. It could have been a stake. Most historians and theologians think it was just the cross beam. His hands would be bound. But others believe it was a long tree. But his hands would be bound up above. But nevertheless... Scripture says he began to carry the cross. Simon had to carry the cross. He probably did fall. The cross is heavy. He's been awake all night. He's lost all that blood. The crowd is pushing. But if he falls, the first thing that hits him are his knees. And he's not able to reach out. It's his face. And what's on his face? Because he said, you are worthy. They are worthy. And they take him to this hill called Calvary, a place of the skull. And they get a nail that's just sharp enough to pierce the skin. But it's dull enough to cause as much tissue damage as possible. But it's heavy enough to hold a man's weight. Just a religion. Just a belief. Just a faith. No. God in the flesh. Becoming sin for you and me. And his feet. And then the cross. The cross.
cross should be lifted high. And when it's dropped from the ground, the shoulders would dislocate. And the only way to breathe is to pull down on two rusty nails. Or to push up on a rusty nail. And it doesn't mention the flies that swarm. We live in Oklahoma. We know what happens when things are dying. And birds come and they begin to pick the flesh and you can't chew them off. He didn't just die for my sins and your sins and their sins. He became sin. The Bible says so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. My friends, stop for just a minute. It's not just a story. Look at him. See him hanging there as he looks into heaven and he says, Father. And then as he looks at you and me and he says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then he yells, to tell his side. We translate it as, it is finished. But literally it means paid in full. In other words, they were worth it. And I paid their price. They take a spear and they thrust it into his side. Don't ever say you're not worth anything. He loves you so much. And he's so very worthy. But he didn't stop there because he said you're worthy. They put him in the ground. They put a stone to keep him there. But because he loves you so much, he took the keys of death and the grave. After three days, he came out. He walked on this earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And they watched him ascend to heaven. We say ascend because it sounds spiritual. Let me just tell you, he flew. Superman ain't got nothing on Jesus. Jesus flew. And he went up and the angel said, he's coming back in the same way. But because he loves you so much and because he says you're so very worthy, he's praying for you every day and every night. And he's preparing every day and every night. He's working on a place for you. And let me just tell you, I don't care how big my mansion is or how small my cottage is. I'm going to be with him. He's what heaven is. Heaven is the king. He is my exceedingly and great reward. He is your exceedingly great reward. And he's coming back. How much is he worth, my friends? He's not an idea. And yes, he is my friend that sticks closer than a brother. But may I be his friend. May you be his friend. At the cross, there were people who came to nail him there because they had done it hundreds of times. It was their job. It was their duty. How many of us, we come to church because it's our job, it's our duty, it's our obligation. We read our Bibles. We say our prayers. We do what's right because that's what we're supposed to do. But some of them stayed because they were going to get something from him. They were going to get his clothes and how many of us, we stay because we want something from him. We want to go to heaven. We want his blessings. We want his healings. We want something from him. When we get him, we get everything. But those soldiers who stayed there ended up playing games. And how many of us, we stay there and all we do and all we've done is end up playing games at the foot of the cross. And we're so close to the cross like I was for 20 years I was so far from Christ there was one soldier who at the risk of losing his job at the risk of losing his friends his co-workers at the risk of losing his family at the risk of losing his life knelt down and he said, truly. He counted the cost. He said, he's worthy. Truly, this man, he's worth more than my job. He's worth more than my friends. He's worth more than my family. He's worth more than my rights. He's worth more than my reputation. This man is worth 
everything. Truly, this man is the son of God. If you could, please stand. And as pastor comes, I want to ask this question. Are the things that you're living for, are they worth this? Are your rights, are they worth it? Your reputation, is it worth it? Your stuff, is it worth it? The only thing I know for sure that's worth this is your life and theirs. Father, we just come before you this morning and Father, we face the reality that sometimes we see the cross and, and we don't embrace it for what it's really worth, Lord. So we just come before you in repentance, Lord, and say sorry, Lord, that we take for granted the price that you paid for us. But we also celebrate this morning, Lord, that you bought our freedom, that we are the righteousness of Christ by what you did on the cross. So we also celebrate that and we say thank you to you, Lord. We say thank you so much. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you've never given your life to Christ and made him Lord, you can do that right now. Don't, I want to encourage you, don't wait another day. If that's you, just slip your hand up and say, yes, I want to give my life to Christ. If that's you, just slip your hand up. God's here and he's, he's watching. He loves you so much. Anyone today? Father, we just thank you so much that you loved us so much that you call us your your friend. May we have a close walk with you, Lord. May we represent you this week, that we don't, Father Lord, just wait for opportunities, but we seek opportunities to share the amazing story of Jesus with people in our area of influence, Lord. As we get back, the last song we're going to have, we're just going to worship the Lord one last time before we close out. If you're on the prayer team, come on up front. If you need prayer over anything, you've got decisions, you've got big things coming up, let us pray with you as we get back into one last song before we close.
Father, you are worthy. We say you're worthy today. You're worthy of our honor and our praise. You're worthy of our attention. You're worthy of our time. You're worthy of our schedule. You are worthy, Lord. So we say, glory be to your name. We love you so much for you are the worthy one. May we go this week, church, reflecting the worthy one in our speech and our love and our sacrifice. May everything we do point people to Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for being with us today. We honor your name in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's give God one clap of praise for his goodness. And let's just uh, real quick extend your hand toward Keith and Natalie. We want to pray over them. He gets ready to go out to another country. Father, we just pray blessings over them. We pray for your power to infuse them, Father Lord. They would say everything you want them to say. We pray for protection. And I pray for people's hearts that have never heard the story of Jesus would already begin to be prepared to receive salvation. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. You guys have a great week. Whoever finds God. We'll see you.